Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and my research has been around autoimmunity in COVID-19. I've been highlighting this point since early 2020. The scientific community, I think, is gradually starting to understand the implications of autoimmune responses around severe COVID-19 and anything related to the spike protein. That's been my research, and it has allowed me to extrapolate a number of thoughts. So today I'm going to be highlighting a few questions. So it's important at the outset that I am clearly stating to you that this is just me thinking. I don't know if this is correct. I'm just extrapolating my thoughts that I've reflected on for some time, and I'm beginning to wonder if this is relevant. So there are a few things that I'll be covering. The article that has recently been talking about the Wuhan lab and the funding for it. I'll also be talking about the paper, the genomic structure of SARS-CoV-2, and I'll be looking as well at a paper in 2021 about toxin-like peptides in the plasma and urine. So that's the extrapolation that I'll be doing here. And for anyone who listens to me regularly, you have to understand that these bits of thinking are way ahead of everybody else. So it may seem very strange, but you just have to work with me to understand why, from a clinical perspective, I'm interested in this. I'm not fascinated with the politics. The politics is for someone else. I'm interested in the clinical relevance and how it affects patients in a day-to-day -day basis. So let's start with some basic things. As I mentioned previously, there was on the twenty fourth of um, on the twenty fourth of September. This was in the Telegraph. China lab suspected of COVID leak stripped of U.S. funding for viola violating biosafety rules. So the U Wuhan Institute of Virology broke rules with experiments that increased viral activity more than tenfold says the health department. So as I said, this was on the 24th of September, 2023. There are a few things about this that are clear. I know this is behind a paywall. So if you want to look at it, the link is in the description. The point being is that it seems that the US has acknowledged that they were funding this lab and that they think that the Wuhan Institute of Virology were increasing the viral activity and they are in insinuating that this was beyond what it is that they were aware of. So I guess the point is, is that yes, it, it clearly indicates that there is an acknowledgement funding. It doesn't seem to clearly indicate what that funding exactly was for if the Wuhan Institute broke their rules. So before I go any further, I'm going to pray, play with you a two and a half minute clip from GB News that was published just about a day ago. Listen to this. Chinese lab at the center of the COVID leak theory is in trouble for violating biosafety rules. Hey, what's the worst thing that could happen, Catherine? <laughs> well, uh, you said it first. Uh, they are suspected of the COVID leak and have been stripped of the US funding for violating the biosafety rules. Um, in these experiments that uh, apparently this lab did, which occurred between 2018 and 2019, one chimeric virus killed 75% of infected humanized mice within two weeks. So that sounds a bit more deadly than COVID. It's a lot of mice. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a lot of humans if it got out <laughs> as well. Yeah. So... Um, in the months before the pandemic, the Institute had registered patents for repairs to ventilation sim sim symptoms and broken seals, and it is believed to have worked on viruses at inappropriate biosafety levels. Jeez. Always change your air vents. Yeah. And this, I mean, this seems to, Darius, this seems to corroborate a lot of uh, what was described as far-right conspiracy theories up until recently. Well, the, the COVID lab leak, if this is the, the same lab, they're doing yeah. these experiments on, on novel bat coronaviruses. <laughs> in uh, Wuhan. And, and, <laughs> making them deadly the, in, in Wuhan. And also, 
they didn't have the safety, uh, proper safety equipment and protocols to stop it escaping. I mean, this pretty much suggests that, yeah, the lab leak... Well, the best thing about the whole lab leak theory is you weren't allowed to say it because that was ra that's racist to even suggest that this is a racist thing to say. I said, OK, so the actual official theory then is that some Chinese person ate a bat. That's even more racist. <laughs> that's more racist than saying that. But the best thing is this quote is a quote from one of the doctors there, Dr. Dazak, and he says the following... None of the work changed animal viruses so they can infect humans they only affected human cell cultures and that's a big difference that's like me saying oh no none of the work i did was responsible for this even though it's definitely responsible for this thing that definitely <laughs> happened but you can trust me it's absolutely fine yeah um and also I, the revelation that the U.S. is stopping funding it. Yeah. Wow. I, didn't know, I didn't know the U.S. was funding these <laughs> Chinese bio labs in the first place. And I don't really understand why the U.S. is funding a coronavirus lab in Wuhan in the well, first place. Well, apparently well, they're, they, they're, they're funding these, these labs all over the world. And there was, well, and there was a lot of, well, these, these labs are being funded apparently all over the world. And there was a lot that were being funded in Ukraine and... Uh, Suddenly, there's been less. Uh, I don't want to go into my conspiracy theories. Right. Well, I'm just happy I get to go back to eating bat soup. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's essentially the clip from GB News. And they were making fun of the situation, and I understand that. The point, though, is that this has some very serious implications. And that's the bit that I am particularly interested in, because... As I mentioned two years ago, the point was, if this was a lab leak, what was the intention of the creation of the virus? Now, some people could say they were just playing around in a lab and they kind of messed around and created something quite dangerous. That's quite possible. But it's foolish to assume that was the, the situation without investigating. And therefore, it is important to consider the possibility that it was intentional. Now, I don't know if it was, but it's important to consider the possibility. If this is intentional, the problem is, is that I would think that if you were designing something to cause harm, and that's what they said from the viral cultures, it was causing more harm in humans than, it, than would be expected from a normal coronavirus, one would assume they would try to make it do as much harm as it could. That's where the clinical bit comes in. Because how can one differentiate or how can one work out what's happening with patients if you don't fully understand what's going on with the spike protein of the virus? So let's start with some simple things. So I was going through this research here, and this is a paper from 2021, and they're talking about SARS-CoV-2 from its discovery to gen genome structure, transcription, and replication. And so it's an important paper, and it's highlighting critically, this is the bit that I wanted to show you, the layout of the proteins, the non-structural proteins that it makes, as well as the structural accessory proteins. And it's comparing the different viruses, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV, MERS, um, this is another coronavirus, and looking at the proteins that they make from that RNA sequence. So that's the standard perspective that one would have on what the virus is doing. It infects a person, it replicates specific proteins that are designed to then cause the virus to spread more freely. It causes damage, yes, but suppose the codes, and this is where the mRNA codes come in, because the codes help to make specific building blocks for proteins. But here's the interesting bit. Depending on the overlap that you have, and again, I bring you up this picture here so you can see it. So in the human, it will make these proteins. This is the S protein. This is the ORF1B, the ORF1A. And it makes all these proteins from the human proteases that are picking up the mRNA. The question is, is it possible that this same sequence especially this sequence, if it is in another organism, say, for instance, a bacteria, would it make the same spike protein or would it cut it up using different proteases to make completely different proteins? That's now the thinking outside the box. 
There's a reason why I'm looking at this, and it's because some very important research that I have shared before, but it is so important to go back to it because it was breakthrough research at the time. And I'll show you this here. This is from Carla Brogna. We recently had him on one of our conferences, and this was in 2021. And what they found were toxin-like peptides in the plasma, urine, and fecal samples from COVID-19 patients. This is really significant. So what was fascinating about this research, and it was almost too strange for many people to acknowledge, they effectively discounted this research in 2021. But the more or the longer that this goes on, the more significant this research becomes. Because when you look very carefully at what they found, they found, and I'll have to bring this uh, bring this up in a different uh, window so that you can see this table. Um, but this table here, and I'll show you this picture here. This table is from the paper, and the paper is in the description. They looked at the candidate proteins in which toxin-like peptides were had been mapped, and they looked at all of these proteins that were produced, this basic phospholipase 2, phospholipase A, A2, zinc metalloproteinase, acidic phospholipase A2, uh, there was a venom pro prothrombin activator as well, a short neurotoxin 4, coagulation factor 4. These were being produced not in the human cells, but in bacteria. And that's what was really, really strange. Essentially, they found that when they cultured the stool of people who had been infected with the COVID or coronavirus, um, SARS-CoV-2, one, they found that there were increased levels of RNA in the stool with the bacteria. And then when they used specific antibiotics, they were able to reduce the amount or completely eliminate it with some antibiotics. That strongly suggests that bacteria were making the RNA or pieces of it. And critically, that bacteria were also making these unusual proteins, these conotoxins that were present in the feces, in the plasma, and in the urine of people who were affected. That is absolutely significant. Because the mistake that we make is that we assume that it is only the protease in the human that is relevant. But no, each bacterial spe species will have their own enzymes that could work on strips of RNAs. Not common, that's a bacteriophage property. But this is the bit that was so significant about this paper. It clearly indicated that the spike protein of the virus, this is what it seems to be, also has bacteriophage properties. From a clinical perspective, I cannot express to you how important that is to understand. That kind of information, in terms of it, it put it this way, if you are trying to fix somebody who has taken an overdose of a medication, if you don't know what the medication is, you can't treat them adequately. In the same way, if someone has taken a poison, if you don't know what it is, how do you treat it? Therefore, in the context of the potential of these abnormal proteins being produced by our own bacteria in the gut, when they come into contact with the virus, quite possibly the spike protein, they seem to be making completely different proteins from it than the human. As I said, if this was designed and designed to create harm, you cannot do anything more effective than turning a microbe against the person. Because our bacterial load, mouth, gut, um, in the, um, all through the system, even on our skin, is based on a mutual respect and functioning together, a symbiotic relationship. 
anything that alters that is likely to cause disease. So I'm asking here a very deep question. And so for those who can understand what it is that I am talking about, I am focused on if this is possible, and the research suggests that it does happen with bacteria, these codes need to be understood urgently. For those people who keep on saying that this is just a cold, you need to reflect very carefully on whether or not where it came from. I don't have any arguments about people's perspective on things, but it's very important that we always hold our leadership into account to ensure that every stone that needs to be turned is turned. Every angle is looked into because it could have an implication for the health of whole populations. That's my lesson for today. I'm sure that I'll be speaking about this again in the future because we really need to get the answers for this very quickly in order to mitigate what could be an ongoing sickness across populations related to the bacteria in our guts, in our throats, in our mouth. Have a great evening, and I'll speak to you again soon.